morning and welcome to the first sunrise safari of the weekend. My name is Brent Leo Smith. I have Brian Joubert on camera. We have James Henry and Andrew Francis on the other vehicle and Geraldine and Kirsten in final control. As you can see, I've had to relinquish my camera operating skills and I think you, everyone out there, uh, and including Jamie, will be very happy about that. I think I'll stick to my day job. Uh, rather than trying to operate the camera, although I did have quite a bit of fun with those wild dogs. So, plan for the morning. There's, there were some, there was some lion audio, but we weren't exactly sure which direction it was coming from. So, James is heading off towards the northern boundary, and I'm heading down the western sections of the reserve, and hopefully we will find some tracks. We're going to be going very slowly in the beginning of drive uh, before the sun breaks out of the east so we don't miss any tracks. So you'll notice my headlights will be on while we drive down the road. But very excited. And in the past, Saturday has sometimes been known as Catterday, so hopefully we can pull out Catterday out of the hat. And while we continue in search of Africa's big cats, Let's jump on the back with James, who has got a striped donkey to show you. I do not believe that Brent Leo Smith used the term Cato Day. I'm astonished. I will have to have a word with him when I return back to camp. Good morning to all of you, and welcome to this beautiful zebra sighting. The zebras are frolicking about in an atmosphere that can only be described as slightly eerie and deeply beautiful at the same time. We've been driving slowly up the road here. We found these zebra beautifully framed by the semi-green below and those beautiful gray clouds above, which unfortunately will no doubt burn off in the face of the, uh, well, very powerful summer sun shortly. My name is James Hendry. Andrew is on camera. He is still wearing a head torch like a one of the dwarfs going off to sort of mine, I think. Hi ho, Andrew. Hi ho. There we go. And my plan this morning is to just keep an eye out for the lions that were heard on the Juma Dam cam during the course of the n night. Apparently, about half past four, they were going ballistic, calling all over the place. Not sure where they are, but we'll just keep an eye out here. And also, of course, hoping desperately to see the wild dogs, perhaps. That update came from you, Lucy, in Indiana, so thank you so much for that. Now, one of these zebras has got a, le a limp. He's lame. He's trotted, he was trotting along. There he is. I think he's that one there, Andrew. Yeah, that's him. He was trotting along and limping. Now, you don't want to be doing that in front of lions because lions will pick up an injury like that. They'll pick up when potential prey item is sick or if it's lame and infirm and they will target it. They're amazingly clever at doing something like that. Lions are the only real threat to an adult zebra in this area. Aren't their colors fantastic? And just listen to the atmosphere that we have here. I'm just going to be quiet for the next 15 seconds and I'll tell you what I can hear. Maybe 17 seconds. So again, a very subdued sound of the morning in the drought. We've got some white-browed scrub robins. And then some sabota larks in the background, just like a swizzling kind of call. One or two Franklins deep in the valleys. A couple of drongos, perhaps a canary or two, and a white and a grey-headed sparrow. But otherwise, it's very quiet. You can hear each footfall from those zebras, each little mouthful that they grab and tear off of the last remaining green grass. Now, we have a question about their stripes and whether or not they are all the same. Now, Georgie, it's your question, and 
The stripes are not the same at all. You can see that there, Georgie, and it's one of the things that a, a new guide will cite as, you know, very amazing that zebras do not have all the same stripes, that they're all completely unique. If you think about it, however, it would be far more remarkable were they to have all the same stripes. None of our characteristics as human beings are exactly the same unless we happen to be fraternal twins. And, sorry, not fraternal, what's the other one? Identical twins. So it would be astonishing were those complex arrangement of stripes that zebras have to be the same on every individual. So no, Georgie, they're not the same at all. They're all different, just like a fingerprint. You can tell the zebras from each other by the stripes. And apparently the youngsters, the foals, do imprint their parents' stripes or their mother's stripes. And that's how they recognize them. I'm not sure that I buy that. I mean, I've read it a few times. I'm not entirely sure that I buy it, especially given that something like an impala, which to our eyes looks almost identical, they're able to find their mothers in an enormous herd of seemingly identical-looking females. Right, that was a good start to the morning. Lovely zebras. I think we're going to head on now. We're just not too far from the dam on the northern side of Biffles Hook here, called Sydney's Dam. We're going to head off there and see if the wild dogs aren't herring towards it, chasing a herd of impala now. Hello, Jen. You say that the zebra I said was lame was also missing half of its tail and holding it strangely. Uh, that's not too unusual. Could well have been attacked by lions. I don't think the limp was a result of any kind of attack. But lots of times you will see zebras with sort of claw marks that came down, that come down the rump or half a missing tail, something like that. They often escape being attacked by lions. They buck and they kick very effectively. So I'm not surprised the tail is missing. That limp, though, is definitely in the front left foot. And so that wouldn't be from, a, it could have been from a chase from lions. He could have stepped in a hole. I suspect just in the normal course of living in the bush out here, he's probably tripped over something, stood on a giant thorn or stepped in a hole and probably got some kind of an injury, tendon or ligament injury in either the fetlock joint down there or perhaps even higher up in the shoulder. Beautiful, beautiful atmosphere, this. I just think it's wonderful. Now, we are hoping the clouds are going to stay. And yesterday, they hung around for a long time. The yesterday, the clouds were with us until about probably almost 12 o'clock. Thereafter, they burnt off and the sun came through. And it wasn't too hot yesterday. It was about 33 degrees. But it does feel that much hotter because we know that there's going to be no rain. Right, this is exactly the kind of place, perhaps, that the wild dogs will try and be chasing something around here. Morning, Jack. Uh, no. Yeah. Okay. Hello, cat. Zebras, you want to know if they make a sound? Well, actually, they make a very loud sound, and it gives them their, A, their Latin name, and B, the first English name that they had, and that was Quacha. That's an onomatopoeic sound from the alarm call that they make. And quite unlike a neighing horse or a braying donkey, the zebra goes How's that, Andrew? Decent, decent. Oh, I think so, yeah. And that is what a zebra does. They also... They also... Uh, Jerry was just giving me three out of five there. Very unkind of Jerry, especially in the fragile ego of the morning. Right, there's absolutely nothing going on at this waterhole. I'm just going to stop here briefly, simply because there are two impala looking quite nervous. Just over there. Lovely sound of Rusty's brakes there. Zebras also will alarm call or snort. If they're not that alarmed, they'll go...
they do look quite alarmed. Let's just sit here for two minutes and see what's going to happen there. There is some hippo in the water there. I thought I saw a crocodile here yesterday. Very few seem to believe me, which of course is another blow to my already fragile ego. And in the background, a blacksmith lapwing. Find the crocodile, Andrew. Andrew, of course, was ill yesterday, so he has joined us today. Andrew, you're feeling better, are you? Able. Yes. Andrew had a little bit of an upset stomach. We don't know why. We had to quarantine him, of course. One doesn't want that sort of thing running through the camp, as it were. That hole Andrew, I think that hole is a burrow, to be honest, and, then, and I'm not sure what lived in it, but to me it looked quite like it had been excavated, possibly post the dam going down to the levels that it is now. And so, you know, in the normal way, probably an artifact, maybe there is some termite activity down there, but I don't know for sure. I thought maybe the crocodile would like to lay some eggs in there. That wouldn't be unusual. But with the water level at what it is, of course, as soon as it goes up, that cave will be filled. So very interesting. Impala just grazing on the... There's not even any dew, you know. So there's no moisture on the grass that those Impala are eating. Right, let us press on from here. Ooh, I'm just going to turn around immediately because the sky has turned a magnificent shade of blue and the clouds are a great glaring pink. Mm -hmm. Look, Andrew, it's magnificent. Oh. That is very splendid indeed. My plan from here is to head to the eastern side of the reserve, far east, check if there have been any tracks of those lions crossing out or perhaps even in from the northern boundary. Brenty will sort of take care of the south for now and then we'll reassess once we've done a boundary patrol. Very nice, Andrew. That was very artistic. Your day off seems to have uh, increased your, your artistic ability. Just to keep you updated on Brent's progress, he is apparently following up on some alarm calls deep in the block somewhere in the south there, probably around Treehouse Dam or around Zoe's Road. So we'll keep you posted. If something's alarm calling in there, it could well be the lions. We'll get a view of the sun as we get to the top of this little ridge. Very subtle smells around at the moment. Very fresh, but very dry. You don't get that sort of dewy vapor coming off the ground. That would be normal for this time of year. You are 15 years old, and you haven't told us where you are, but you do say that the weather there is below zero, and you would like to know if some of the animals here would survive in those temperatures. Rain, a lot of them would, and a lot of them wouldn't. And you have only to go to the local zoo to see which ones are in need of sort of shelter and which ones can live outside. And I know that you could go to some North American zoos and you can see things like um, Irland, for example, which are enormous re relatives of a kudu. 
and they'll have look they'll have big shaggy coats on them which they wouldn't normally have here so many of the animals here would adapt to living in the cold i think something like an impala certainly the springbok of the kalahari and that sort of thing would not cope in prolonged cold and i don't know that about the predators the predators probably just grow long coats as well i think they would survive a lot more easily than we think they would but some would certainly die i think the smaller the animals would re this really little ones like the rodents and that sort of thing if they're not adapted to cold they don't survive very well that is very beautiful Dean says, because I'm the greatest landscape photographer in the world, I'd better take a photograph of this. Well, I could, but you know, I set up my tripod and check the light balance with my light meter and, you know, clean the lens. But I'll take one photograph. We'll see what it looks like. Andrew, do you think it'll be good? Yes. I think it'll be epic. lines across it, Andrew. I think Stefan, oh, uh, I know. This was on video mode. I'm so good with my camera, Andrew, that I took a video of the sun by mistake. It's possibly not, not that amazing, really. Um, I think we'll press on, don't you? Yes. Yes. One thing you can count on from Andrew Francis, of course, is brutal honesty at all times. <laughs> Jin B, you say I must remember to take a picture for my mummy. Well, my mummy, the last time I showed her my photograph, said to me, don't you ever take any pictures of anything other than the sun? And I had to admit to her that, uh, no, I don't tend to take many other pictures, so I'm trying to work on that. And while I am working on that, let's go across to Brent. He's deep in a block just before we go to Brent. Sorry, let's have a look here. There are three hornbills. Now one hornbill, because two have run away. Now there's still two there, sitting. And they were just making that lovely morning call of theirs. That and so often they sit on a tree exposed to the first rays of the sun, but puffed out, enjoying the sunrise. There we go. Well, we're going to enjoy that hornbill for a little longer. We'll hand you across to Brent. He'll give you an update on the alarm calls that he's following up on, and I will see you in just a little while. We're still moving through the western sections of Juma Private Game Reserve. We had some Impala alarm calling, but occasionally they get it wrong. So what we think there is we saw a diker that was sort of creeping through the bush. And we think those Impala got confused and thought said diker was a leopard just from the way it was moving and decided to start snorting. So we got very excited for a short while, but unfortunately, no cat. We've come into this area where there was a report of those lions. Crossing in. And unfortunately we couldn't see any tracks yesterday because the roads had been dragged. So what I'm hoping is that now, overnight, if the lions were in this area, that they've decided to walk down one of the roads. So far, no luck, but we're going to keep checking. Quite 
excited for Valentine's Day out there. don't we ever show you art fuck uh, Judy we would love to show you art fuck uh, they're just uh, quite a difficult species to get and the reason for this is they are deeply nocturnal and, uh, you find a lot of those very nocturnal species are so, yeah, come out when we're not on safari so it is a evolutionary tactic that they've developed right, to avoid your apex predators such as lion and leopard and even hyena to a degree. So lion and leopard in particular are most active for that first two hours after dark and that first two to three hour or the first hour before dawn and so you find artfark, African civet, uh, quite a few of those type of species will then change depending on the seasons, but they will get moving sort of that third or fourth hour even after dark. So around 11 o'clock at night, that's when they'll probably be most active, 11 till about 3. Uh, and that makes sure they're most active outside of the apex predator's most active period. So it helps them not get eaten. In some areas, in the Kalahari, it's incredible. You can actually see them active during the days, quite rarely. Gotcha. No, honey badger tracks. No. You can see honey badger's been walking along here. There are the tracks. Now, honey badgers, strangely enough, are actually you see them quite often here in Juma when you're on foot. But they are very high, highly mobile little creatures. And I actually had an incredible sighting a few days ago. Uh, Jamie and James were out in the vehicles and I was out tracking. It was after the morning Jamie had the first time those two packs came together two packs of wild dogs a couple of days ago and I was walking in this area down near the Mawati and I happened to find a honey badger moving through the drainage system so I just followed him quietly from a distance of about 30 meters uh, he didn't realize I was there and as he crossed out I followed him and he came around to my round back towards me and only saw me about a meter and a half it was too close for my camera to focus and then he got a little bit of a fright and he ran away but definitely the best honey badger sighting I've had on foot and when tracking you see them regularly it's probably because when you are tracking uh, and not on bushwalk or on drive you are much quieter when you're walking by yourself so you do see more things specifically the, the more shy and retiring things So far it looks like even the cats are shining, shy and retiring so far this sunrise safari. Blank canvas of tracks and oh, blank canvas for tracks in front of us. And only a single honey badger going that way so far. and sun shiny good morning to Lev in Brooklyn and Lev says there's pride of lions on the Incoro cam and 
I'm not sure which pride there. It's not sure which pride, but this, this is, is this possibly a pride we know and how far away is it from us? It's probably the Nkuhuma pride. Uh, they have been in that area for quite a few days. And uh, it's probably, as the crow flies from where we are now, about six, seven kilometers. So not too far, but it is a bit far for them to maybe make an appearance this sunrise. Safari. And here we go. Oh. Lilac breasted roller. Now there's two reasons we stop in to look at the lilac breasted roller. One, that they're a very pretty bird and a firm favorite of a lot of our viewers. The second, it gives me a chance to just keep quiet for a few seconds and listen to the bush. And so if there is any lion audio. Oh, what you got behind there? Oh, there's a very interesting bird. Let's grab my binoculars quickly. That's quite an interesting one at the back. Uh -huh. So, let's start off with a bird quiz. And we've got multiple species in shot, and I've already mentioned the one on the left. But, what is that bird in the dead tree behind? It is a bird of prey. Now, I'm going to give you a few hints at what to look at. Look at the legs. Oh, stretch. And look at the face. And who can tell me what bird of prey is sitting in that retired knob thorn? If you know the answer, pop me an email on questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Beautiful, soft morning light on both these birds. There we go, there's the roller now. Unfortunately, no alarm calls or deafening roars breaking the dawn. much in terms of sound there. Now, Safari Dean's got quite an interesting question for us. Uh, he would like to know, why would birds alarm call at lions and not humans? Surely humans are a greater threat. Now, humans have only managed to develop weapons that can shoot, like catapults, slingshots, arrow, etc. Relatively recently on the evolutionary scale. So it's more than likely that the birds haven't had enough time to adjust to us being major predators on them. If you walk close to a bird's nest, they will alarm call at you. Right? They, they sort of know we're far more threatening from a, from a nest raider point of view uh, than from when they're scurrying about on the ground. Whether this is just a theory, guys. This is not possible. Um, I think the shape of a cat is something that is so, so evolutionary ingrained uh, in all the animals out here that it is something you have to be careful of, something that could eat you. It doesn't matter whether it's a cat this big or a cat that weighs 400 pounds. So that's probably the reason you, you, you'll find that. It makes the most sense to me. the dried up treehouse waterhole and I'm hoping that there's still some water in the sea. Well, it seems like it must be early where you guys are as well because everyone's a 
bit slow waking up this morning. So we've had a goshawk, uh, we've had a Warburg eagle, and a, a brown snake eagle as the answers. And unfortunately, none of those are correct. So keep at it, guys. And uh, closest being in the right sort of area and family is the brown snake eagle. another one a tawny eagle that's also incorrect think about it guys think about a brown snake eagle think about what might look like a brown snake eagle and no i thought i heard a squirrel alarming but it was not And I think there still is a little bit of water there, and even without seeing, and I know we couldn't see from the dam wall, but the fact that there's a Cape turtle dove on the ground and it was actually coming out of the hole, makes me think there is possibly still water. Let's have a look. Oh, there's another one still drinking, I think. tiniest little bit of water left in the seat. So, there we go. I'm just going to have a quick look right at there, see if there's any lion or leopard tracks right there. So, we've got quite a lot of other animals. I can see wildebeest have used it. Pala, waterbuck, hyena, African civet, and Janet. Now this, th these natural seeds like this absolutely amaze me. And historically, these would have been so, so important before the man-made water holes. This would have been one of the only bits of water in this whole vast area that we traverse on Juma. So really, really interesting. And uh, I love coming to these things. And amazing enough, they're some of my favorite places in Africa are, are almost in semi-desert in the Kalahari in Botswana where you have these natural seeps coming. And at those places, you've got these perfect little circles of stones of concrete built up, definitely man-made. And what they, what they are is sand or bushman hunting blinds. So they would sit in this little, basically, not even very high, sort of a couple of feet, four foot high, a round circular section of stone that they built to hide, and that's how they would ambush animals as they came down to these very limited drinking areas. What you got? Fly on the lens. Oh my goodness. Um, it's a bombardier by the looks of things. And I'm going to try. They come, sometimes can fly quite slowly. It's a very big, pretty fly, so I'm not going to move it just yet. Sorry, Brian. I know this is like a cameraman's worst nightmare. He's got something on his lens and I said, don't touch it. My insect book here. Sometimes they're quite slow flying, this particular type of fly. Uh, oh, not that one. Well, slow flying for a fly, but still a lot faster flying than my catching skills. But yeah, well, I'll drive off. There we go. Actually, how's that? <laughs> that doesn't happen very often that you actually open the book. And I said it's a, a bumblely day. That's the family. Um, sort of very, very cool flies. They're mostly nectar feeders. And the one we had on the lens was number three. You could actually see the life patch of the uh, wing coming through. So it doesn't have a common name. It's only got a, a scientific name, which is a bit of a mouthful. Exoprosopa nemesis. And very, very interesting. It's a parasitic fly. And the larva parasitizes wasps. 
So it's actually often seen hanging around the sort of tunnels of mud dauber and burrowing wasps. And being close to this little bit of water, this will be an excellent spot to actually pick up one of those wasps and follow them home to lay their, your eggs in their larvae. So some of them are nectar feeders. That particular one is parasitic. And you can see some of the other ones or nectar feeders. But that particular one we just saw, Exoprosopa nemesis. And obviously the, the scientific name nemesis, and he's obviously a nemesis to all of the mud dauber wasps. There we go, isn't that interesting? Now, if we had to come to this little bit of water in the heat of the day, there would be an incredible amount of wasps and flies and butterflies and all that utilizing this tiny bit of water. Everyone is taking a long time to wake up this morning. Safari Dean is being a, a joker. I think he said uh, a Warburg's brown snake, tawny hawk. That is definitely incorrect. Um, and there wasn't even one part of that that was correct. Uh, and then a lot of other people have said step buzzard. And again, incorrect. Now I'm going to give you another hint so you can keep at it. Uh, it is a juvenile of a bird we see quite commonly. And speaking of birds of prey, maybe James is going to be a bit easier to identify than this one. Identifying what we have got to show you here, everybody, is not going to be easy in the slightest, mainly because that bird is sitting behind a branch and is silhouetted by the rising sun, or risen sun. But I think I know what it is. Let us know what you think it is. Hashtag Safari Live, questions at wildearth.tv. I think, in fact, I'm not even going to make you do that. It's really not easy at all. There are some hammerkops, hammerheads, flying off to find some water where they can eat some frogs and fish. Not many frogs for them to eat this season. Very well spotted there, Andrew. There it goes. Into the sun. And I think what that bird was, everyone, is a step buzzard. It had that kind of jizz. Jizz, of course, general impression, size and shape. And I thought I saw when I looked at it with my very powerful binoculars, you see how powerful my binoculars are, I could see that distinct line across the chest where there, there's barring up until there, and then the stripes come. And there's a very distinct line on the chest. And I just thought I caught a glimpse of that. But bar seeing that, almost impossible to discern what bird that was, except to say that I'm pretty sure it wasn't a Wahlberg's eagle, simply because it didn't have that little crest that comes up and down every so often. So let's go with Step Buzzard on that one. Andrew, are you satisfied with that diagnosis? Yes. Well done. Excellent stuff. On we go. We are now in the Far East, on the Cheetah Cut Line, looking for Cheetah or anything else. We've done the entire northern boundary of Juma. No tracks coming in or out of predators. Plenty of zebra going up and down the place, one or two nyala and a diker. But nothing in the way of large predatory beasts with enormous claws and vicious canines. I'm not sure what happened to Brent's alarm calls, but clearly they were not being made at something very obvious. So we'll drive down here very slowly, just check the tracks, see what's happening, and then we'll probably head along the southern boundary as well. Hmm. Now, Michelle, oh, there's a big elephant. Andrew, see that big gray thing going across the road? That's an elephant. Marvelous. Michelle, while we're catching up with that enormous elephant, you're in New Jersey. There's a whole lot more here. Oh, no, that's not an elephant at all. Um, while 
we drive. Oh, there's a whole lot of stuff going on here. There's a raptor that just came off the ground. Sorry, Michelle, I will get back to you. You want to know about dive bombing birds and would a would any of the birds out here dive bomb a small predator? Perhaps like a an American blue jay would dive bomb a domestic cat. Michelle, yes, they would, but probably not the large raptors. It would probably be there goes the elephant. It would probably be things like drongos. It isn't the elephant at all. It's a thick piece of bush. Where'd the elephant go? Here he is. You got him. Amazing how silent they are. Michelle, things like the drongos would absolutely bomb small predators. They bomb things like slender mongoose and that sort of thing. Okay, here we go. This is a very big elephant bull. Hello, friend. He doesn't seem to want to have too much to do with us, unfortunately. He's just hiding himself behind that red bush willow. And listening. Now he's listening very carefully. You can see he's stopped moving so he can hear. Big adult bull. Magnificent fellow. You may be able to hear two things one, the flapping of his ears, and the other, the call of the chin spot battus. See how his ears have been torn over years of walking through the thorny bush and flapping his ears amongst the trees. <laughs> you just see his trunk trying to find a decent piece of greenery to eat. It's going to become more and more difficult, of course. He is really old and wizened. I would put him at about 45 to 50 years. probably just looking for things to eat. If he was to come, if we were to follow his tracks from the direction that he came, so in other words, track him backwards, I think you'd find that he'd come from Torchwood Pan, which is inside the reserve called Torchwood, just to the east of where we're sitting now. So he's probably had his morning drink, and he's now having his breakfast. Just listen to the birds for another 10 seconds. Southern black tits, a nediki calling. Dee, 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 dee. Rattling cysticula. All very much in the background, though, not a, an explosion of dawn chorus, just a very quiet one. That's the chin spot battis, as you can hear. Not three blind mice at all, which is what people will tell you it sounds like. Perfectly still. And that old bull seems to be sort of carrying a, a large bubble, be surrounded by a bubble of peacefulness. I'm not going to chase him through there. The bush is very thick, and he's such a peaceful fellow. Wasn't that special? <laughs> I think that's just magnificent. I'm just going to sneak slowly a little bit forward, and there's some water back. Cows over there. 
I'm loath to even start the engine in an atmosphere like we're sitting in now. There they are. The elephant came straight past them. And they too are looking for last bits of green grass. They like this clearing, they like this fire break that we're on. It's a wide expanse of about 100 meters, or 50 meters at least, of cleared area that acts as a fire break. Obviously not a problem at this stage, but after a heavy rainy season, they will keep this area kind of with very short grass. They'll mow it down, and that just allows them to start a back burn during a fire. I was reading the other day that waterbuck, despite the fact that they look like fluffy teddy bears, are not. They don't, that hair is actually quite sparse. While it's long, it's a lot more sparse than some of the other animals' hair. I've always thought it was very odd that they should have hair so long in an area that is so hot. You can see that green color. We had a question yesterday about what it looks like when it is in the normal rain, normal rain season. And we can see the leaves there are actually quite yellow. They're folded, they're wilting slightly. In a normal summer season, what you can see behind the tree there, that waterbuck grazing along the ground, you wouldn't see. He would be totally hidden by the amount of very green vegetation just on the exactly the same trees that there are here. It would be bright green, they wouldn't be wilting at all, and they'd also be sitting in a sea of much longer grass than this. It's still very beautiful colors. Right, what a lovely, peaceful stop, I must say. It's a tremendously peaceful morning. question here from Judy in Ottawa and there are two aspects to it. Judy, you want to know why it is that elephants have not evolved the ability to digest food more efficiently. So they've got a very inefficient digestive system. I think about 60% of what they eat comes out untouched and you want to know why is that evolved and that's the first part of your question. The second part is perhaps because of the domino effect where were they to be more efficient digesters so the food source that is there done for other creatures wouldn't, you know, wouldn't be as good. The second part of your question I'm going to answer first. Remember that if we're talking about evolution, an animal will never evolve in a way that it's going to help other animals, if you know what I mean. So the fact that an elephant produces dung that is still full of nutrients is not to the benefit, it is to the benefit of other animals, but that's by chance. Other animals will then take advantage of that, and so will not only animals, of course, many plants will take advantage of the fertilizing effect of elephant dung and many insects and bugs and those sorts of things will thrive off elephant dung. Even hippo will eat elephant dung. So they will have evolved to make use of the elephant dung rather than the dung, the elephant evolving to help out other creatures, if you know what I mean. Right, then the second part is why is it so inefficient? Why after m millions of years of evolution has that elephant got such an inefficient digestive system? Well, one of the reasons, of course, is that it works. There's no reason for it to have a more efficient digestive system. That particular digestive system works. And it works because the animal is so big. Now, if you are so big, what it means is that, and you're a hind gut fermenter, so you're not a ruminant. Remember, an elephant does not have a ruminant, can't re-chew its food. It needs a digestive system that is able to process a tremendous amount of food. So while it is very inefficient 
in times of good. We know when there's lots of green grass about, many marula fruits, and it's, there's plentiful food. Then it is very inefficient, and it's not a particularly good system because it does waste a lot of nutrients for the elephant. The elephant's got to eat more than it would necessarily if it had a more efficient digestion. But when times are bad, when times are like they are now, because there is the elephant processes food at such a speed, it can just eat more and more and more when it has to. It doesn't have to worry about getting a stomach full of food that it can't, that is, is useless. And if you're a ruminant, say like a steenbok or a buffalo, your stomach will get so full that you've got to stop, rechew that food, swallow it again before you can eat again. With an elephant, that isn't the case. It can just keep eating and eating and eating. And because the digestion happens fast and because it isn't particularly efficient, it can just push out more and more done as it has to. So that, I think, is why in the larger animals, especially those that aren't hindgut fermenters, they have a particularly inefficient digestive system. Would, would they survive with a more efficient digestive system? Yes, probably. Is there a need for them to have a, a more efficient digestive system out here? No, there isn't. So that's my answer. I hope that kind of gives you an idea of why. Still gently, slowly going down the eastern boundary. Brent is trying to ask me for an update. Hang on one second. Go ahead, Brent. We're going to head across to him right now. I'm going to go probably west along the south. So guys, there's another nice little bird to test you. I'm just on the radio with James, so I'll be with you in a second. Sorry, James, go again. Oh, yeah, copy, thanks. Uh, you copy the update, but they didn't die to audio south of the boundary. Copy, thanks. So guys, I'll update you about that Ngala audio shortly, but here we go, a nice little bird tester for the birders out there. So with these type of birds, what you want to look at is how the thickness of the beak, the little stripes under his neck, and you're looking for any white around the eyes, if it has or if it doesn't, and any windows in the tails. Uh, so windows refers to sort of the white outer tail feathers, so whether it's got or not. So that is quite a difficult one. So what I'll do is if anyone gets in the right family, I'll help you along. But anyway, so if you know what little bird this is, this little LBJ, this little brown job, send your answers through to questions at wildearth.tv. If you're an emailer or use the hashtag Safari Live if you're a Twitter ferian. Well done to Arcee, Karen, and Bella, uh, and many others. I think after I gave away that it was a juvenile, uh, the answers came through fast and furiously. It was a juvenile battalion. Now that one, on the other hand, is going to be a little bit more difficult. Uh, I think you guys have been having far too easier quizzes, so Ryan and I are going to search for the most obscure little birds, and hopefully some of those will add to your total bird totals. That was terrible. Total bird lists rather than total bird totals. Sounds a bit funny. So I just want to check this Mawati River system for any tracks. Oh, 
share something. We share something. We share something. Alarm calling. Uh, it was a Franklin, so it could be from uh, a mongoose or something else, but it could also be from uh, these orchard cats. out of here somewhere. Just gonna look at any tracks there, Brian, that might take away to what it might be. No. Just... So it was... It was quite an explosive alarm call. have those explosive alarm calls it means that, that something has scared the Franklin on the ground they da -da 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 -da, and they take off not like if they see a bird of prey where they'll try hide an alarm call so there's a prominent game path just up ahead of a leopard's tail. So we're just going to sit quietly for 30 or 40 seconds, just listening again, see if anything else starts alarm calling. got there. Something big. A big grasshopper. Can you see, Where is that hornbill? Oh, gone, whatever it was. An African grey hornbill. Seems that all is quiet on the southern front. And well done to Gale in Australia. You got that little bird right. It was a spotted flycatcher. There we go. It had no white eye stripe, streaky breast, and no white windows in the tail. So a lot of a lot of other viewers said dusky flycatcher, and the reason it isn't is if we have a look there, that very distinct white around the eyes and a very pale, almost white under the base of the tail. Very similar sized. So they're 
the spotted slightly larger and in the dusky but uh, very difficult but must always with the fly catchers particularly the little brown fly catchers it's very important to look specifically at the eye stripes and the the tails those are the two very distinguishing features but it seems like no more noise i think i'm going to pop around and return to my original plan which was to travel down the Mawati River system. I apologize, travel up the Mawati River system. of tusks on that big male warthog. You know his tusks getting caught on that branch as he's moving through there. And then off he disappears. I think even a lioness would think twice about tangling with those teeth. And speaking of lionesses, Good morning, Sarah, who's 17 in Ohio, and actually did a school project on the Lion Prides out here. And she's asking if the Talamates and the Nkumas, or the Nkumas are possibly a split or a, sub, a subgroup from the Talamates, is it possible that lionesses from either side would oh, jump ship, so to speak, join the other, join the other pride? and vice versa. So if wooden Nkuma join the Talamates and with the Talamates join the Nkumas. It is possibility, but it's a very small possibility now, sir. They've been uh, separate for so long that I think it's very unlikely, but it is still possible. Okay, so we're back in the Mawasi Riverbed. find some fresh cat traps, but if not, we're on the hunt for obscure birds. personal with this tree which is one of my favorites it's called Spirostachys africanum now I've given you the scientific name let's see if you can work out the common name I'm going to go through a few features of this tree so very very petite leaves and you saw that very almost crocodile like bark And this tree is eaten medicinally by quite a few animals out here. Black rhino, baboon, kudu, giraffe, and elephant. When they have bad parasites in their stomach, have been seen to feed off this tree. Even in Yala occasionally. And let's find a nice leaf. If we pluck the leaf, Maybe I'll put it over here on the dash. Right, get it easier than my shaky hands. There we go. And you can see there's a, a little white drop of milky latex coming out. And I've got to be careful not to touch that. Quite noxious. It'll actually burn me. 
Um, also, you can see that little drop fell over there as I popped it down. Traditional, traditionally, uh, if you cut a branch of Tamburti and you take that milky latex and you pop it on warts, it removes them. So now I've given you all the information to tell me what the common name of this tree is. And it is also one of my favorites. Find them a lot around riverbeds. So let's see who can figure that one out. If you can, send your answers through to questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag SafariLive on Twitter. nice things about these sandy drainage lines is that I can actually track normally and what we do when we track normally is we sit on the tracker seat. We don't have one on these cars. Oh, oh, oh. There we go. Now I can look the track from the front of the vehicle in a much better position uh, than what we normally would. Lovely thick sand keeps the vehicle driving exactly where it should. Fortunately, there aren't too many tracks just here. But it is wonderful. Uh, also, it's in a slightly different position for a bit. Change of scenery. Instead of being behind the drivers, he's there. Uh, sometimes the cameramen have a bit of a worried look on their face when we do things like this. Oh, is actually going to escape the tracks one of these times we try these funny little tricks. But I think we'll be okay. I'll give it a few more seconds. What do you think, Brian? No, it's good. Uh, Brian's good. <laughs> so everything goes wrong. Brian's actually much closer. He's going to have to jump into the steering. No, I'm going to jump ship. The jump ship? Oh, he's going to jump ship. <laughs> he's not even going to try to save the car. He's going to abandon the trip. But now, the other thing is from here, I'm a little actually higher than I would be in the quite a lot further down this little track and the only tracks I see here are around the right hand side looks like they belong to a Nyala. So if they will put a stand in my shoes. But if there were any cat tracks I'd probably even see them from a good 15 or 20 meters. Up way up in here to that junction. Now that junction I probably don't want to be sitting here because we probably will go off course. So let's go back to spot. Oh dear, we have a slight problem. <laughs> Everybody, just a quick turnover here. Uh, we're on. <laughs> found these squirrels alarm calling, but they clearly weren't alarm calling. They're in the throes of passion, and this is not something you see every day. And two days ago, I saw a squirrel with a giant set of testicles because I think it's time for them to be mating, and clearly that is the case. And this little couple possibly has a little nest in this beautiful fallen down knob thorn tree. And I suspect there's a hollowed out hole in there. And that's probably where they will give birth, or she will give birth. <laughs> it's wonderful to see. So they're making that alarm calling sound, and we stopped, and we thought maybe there must be a predator around here. Perhaps a... There they go. You see them, Andrew? They're in that... Yeah, that's it. They're in that scraggly tree there. I'm just going to go a little bit forward. There's definitely no predator here. They are just in the throes of joy. Yeah, they're in there somewhere. We'll just quickly try and see them again. You see them there? Oh, there they are. We've got them. Yeah. There. To zoom right in there. Up, up a bit. There you are. Well, 
Now they do seem to be looking, they look a little bit like they're alarm calling, but they wouldn't alarm call at us. I'm sure it's to do with the, the breeding. There we go. <laughs> it's really is astonishing to see. <laughs> See the tail flicking, just like it would be if she was actually alarm calling. And of course, tomorrow, Andrew. What is the date tomorrow? 14th of February, James. And what is the 14th of February, Andrew? The day of love, James. It is indeed, Andrew. It is Saint Valentine's Day, the day of love. These chaps are a little early. That's probably why she's shouting at him, saying, not yet, my man, tomorrow is our day. He, of course, is unable to contain himself at her beauty. Now he's just standing there looking awkward. <laughs> he winked. Did you see him wink? <laughs> Did he really? Yeah, he winked. Do you think he heard us? See, he's grooming her as well. He's not uh, only mating with her, he's definitely also grooming her. And I'm sure that has something to do with the fact that they, I'm sure he's been grooming her the whole time. It'll be some sort of courtship grooming. Now, as with so many of the animals out here, if she didn't want to be mated with, she could just move, and it would be impossible for him to mate with her. Go ahead. Where are you? Just hold on, Deborah. I'm going to talk to you now. Karula is not far from here on Torchwood. Um, I'm at the junction. I'm near sort of... I'm on Leadwood, Drakensberger Junction. Okay. Um, Just going to get an update quickly. Copy, I'll make my way there. So, Karula is actually heading towards the junction with Central Road and Cheetah Cut Line. So, she could change direction, but we'll go and sit around there. She's quite far away from there for, for the moment, so let's enjoy these squirrels for now, but then we'll head that way. Now, Debbie, you said you hope that he's going to send her flowers. I think you'll find he's already done that. And this is why she is allowing what's going on now to happen. He's sleeping. As he, he's fallen asleep. Look at that. He's exhausted by his, the strains. Now, I have to admit that I don't know a huge amount about squirrel mating and their life cycle. And Kathy in Memphis, you want to know how often they would have babies. You know, they are rodents, which means that they'll be pretty fast breeders. I suspect you'll find that they probably breed three or four times a year, Kathy. I'm not sure exactly, though. I can find out eventually. I just find this most amusing, that she's making exactly the same sound to our ears as she would if she'd seen a leopard walk underneath the tree. But clearly, it's, it's probably very slightly different, and to squirrels, it will sound very different. <laughs> and Lady Luger, you say maybe all of these squirrel alarm calls that we hear and follow up on frantically are actually mating calls. Well, if there were more than one squirrel, often, I would agree with you completely. And 
And this is a lengthy process. I mean, she's been yelling like this since we got here about 10 minutes ago. And I think Andrew is correct. I think he's dozing off on the job. She's going to start alarm calling much more loudly than that if you fall asleep there, chum. His eyes do look like they're getting very heavy. And Michael, on the same sort of vein, do squirrels mate for life? The answer would be probably not. I don't even think they're monogamous. I think that like most rodents, they'll probably mate with, you know, this sort of a courtship display and the female will choose the most dominant male that she can find at the time. Very, very, very few mammals will mate for life. Jackals being one of them, but very few. And very few are even monogamous. Now he's kind of, he slipped off there, of course, and he's now trying to have a snooze behind her. And she is clearly not yet satisfied. There we go. <laughs> Can you still see them there? I'm just going to get another update from Tax while we watch these. Uh, Tax, and how far from Chitakatlan are you now? All right, everyone, they have lost visual of Karula at the moment. She was heading towards pretty much where we are now, but closer to the cheetah cut line. So I think what we're going to do is leave those squirrels. I think they've uh, given us quite a show, don't you, Andrew? And let's just see if we can't spot this magnificent leopard. I have to tell you, I'm a bit worried now that she's so far from where we thought her den was. I think something has gone wrong. We obviously haven't seen her now for, what, three or four days. And nobody's, nobody's seen her for three or four days. And she's quite a long way from the den site and where it was. She hasn't taken any, you know, there haven't been any obvious tracks going in and out of that area. So, I don't know. Eventually we're going to actually have to go and stick our heads in there and have a look. is just over here and I think that's where that elephant came from and Karula is heading from there sort of in a north easterly direction northwesterly direction towards this road and another junction up ahead with Central Road so that's where we're going to go and stand by and I'm just going to wait for tax he's driving up here let me just turn the radio up so that I can coming straight to the west she's heading straight west tax I'm on Cheetah cut line now approaching Central Junction. Where shall I stand by? Yeah, for now, James, I will stand by just somewhere at the junction of uh, Central. Yeah, so you can hear Taxon speaking you know, to me now. So it will be between Central and Pipeline. Okay, copy, thanks. So I'm just going to drive a little bit faster up here. there 
So I think just stay on. Let's stay on this car for now, and then we'll stand by on the road and see what happens. Right. Well, this is where she's going to pop out. With any luck? Unless I've gone mad. I'm just got to check because I don't know the Torchwood roads very well. But I'm pretty sure we're in exactly the right place. Although we're not, we're not quite. We just need to go further up the cut line. So to the eastern side of us is Torchwood. And we can't go on to Torchwood. And to the western side of us, which is the left-hand side of your screen, is Juma. It would be so very nice to see Karula this morning. It's been a very quiet morning so far, although we did have that magnificent elephant bull. coming straight through here somewhere. Little Diker, Diker lamb there. Be happy not to see Karula. Right, this is the road where we need to stand by. Jen, you're in Minnesota and you too think that something perhaps has gone awry with Karula's cubs, especially after she seemed to follow Tingana. Well, Tingana followed her first, but then I think she did follow Tingana south with her. And that, that did seem to be some strange behavior, certainly. Right, we're gonna stand by here. I tell you what, I think we should probably hand you back to Brent for now. She's with a bummer here. Uh, Sorry, just before we do that. Okay. She seems to have a kill. Yeah. Maybe she's yeah, maybe. Hi, uh, good morning. James, um, she, she's in the drainage line, but uh, she's, she's got a kill. So she's here, not going to so come here. She's not coming west anymore. She was just coming to this bomb here. Oh, that's very distressing. Okay, Cobby, thank you. All right, so what she's done is she's killed something, and it's in the drainage line just over the lip of this ridge here. And I don't think she's going to come out here, I'm afraid. I think she's going to eat there wherever she is. And we're not going to see her at the moment. So we're going to head to Buffalshook Dam, see what we can find there. And while we're doing that, go across to Brent, get an update from him, and I'll see you later. So, really exciting that Karula's got some meat, and fortunately, just outside of our Travis area. So, cat day search continues. So, Ryan, where do we think we're going to find a cat? I think we should head back to the west, uh, to where Jamie last saw Shadow. There's a possibility she might be still in that area. Well, uh, well done to everyone and to me. Uh, apparently I mentioned the name of the tree, Brian told me afterwards. So, anyway, a Tamboji tree, a fantastic tree. <laughs> Definitely one of my favourites. Now, 
I realized why Brian had a bemused look on his face while I was nattering away about Baytex. interesting discussion that Brian and I were actually having before drive this morning. Brian says he's noticed that he hasn't heard too many Woodlands kingfishers and Shrub on Twitter is wondering if they've all migrated back northwards. They have not. Uh, we heard some this morning. There are still a few around but there are definitely less Woodlands than last season and that is definitely to do with the, the dry climate we've been, uh, we're experiencing, the dry weather we're experiencing. And Shrub, we will try to find you at Woodlands before the end of safari. So I'm going to jump up onto the northern boundary and head to the west. And uh, try Jamie's trick of checking Sydney's dam three times drive. And it seems to be quite successful. But also, that is the area where Shadow was last seen in that north western corner. So hopefully she's out and about. I've got the elephant tracks around here. this time of year, I think we've had probably about a quarter of our normal rainfall for this time of year, so less grass, even the, some of the trees have started to turn already, but 
as I've said quite a few times, drought is not necessarily a bad thing. Now, if you're a farmer, of course, it's a terrible thing. If you're a commercial farmer or even a subsistence farmer, but if you're in the bush and in a big open system like this, 3.9 million hectares, it's not such a bad thing. So, nature's might control certain species. Oh, speaking of species, there's some elephants. And they're on a mission. I think they might be heading towards... Eventually, the Juma Dam Camp. Nice little breeding herd. But look at them go. got the water walk on. They're quite far from the water still. Now they're all in a row. Now, oh, maybe they're just excited to get into that block to feed. Now, as we saw them walking all in a row like that, it reminds me of something interesting. So, the original colonial collective noun for elephants. Who can remember that? I know I've asked it before. The original colonial collective noun for elephants. If you know the answer, send me an email on questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Just from that behavior, and then they've slowed down there. They don't look that relaxed. They are going into a thick block with no roads. What I might do is slowly loop around to when they might pop out towards the, the central and then maybe even still head towards the Juma waterhole. Why don't you guys keep an eye on the Juma waterhole for me and for James? And if they do pop out there, let us know, and whoever's closest will go find them for you. I apologize. I wasn't aware that the, that the cam is actually having some technical difficulties. I'm so, sure Eugene will try to get it sorted as soon as possible. But just from their general behavior, uh, that very quick walk and that they just didn't look that relaxed and they're still going at speed so I'm going to leave them be. I'm going to do a loop and then I'll make my way back down towards that uh, Juma camp. I think they're going to arrive there It'll probably be in about 20 minutes. those elephants disappear. Gail in Rhode Island likes to so watch do elephants do at night. Are they stationary or do they continue moving around? Yeah, they generally continue to feed throughout the night. They need to sustain those incredibly massive bodies of theirs. Uh, they will rest slightly, but they seem to rest more during the heat of the day than at night. They've got to keep moving to sustain, as I said, huge body. A big Ellie bull needs 250 to 300 kilograms of a vegetable matter in a day. And often around our camps at night you can actually hear them feeding throughout the night. Breaking branches, rumbling, screeching. Another few 
also unfortunately incorrect, a trunk and a string yeah. are not. Now think about how they were walking like that. And there we go. Laura, Teresa, Lorraine and Sharon say a parade, that is correct, a parade of elephants. Now if any of you have ever watched the animated Jungle Book, the first one, I think there's a new one, but I haven't seen that one, and the elephants' characters are based on a military sort of a parade, basically, and you've got the, I think it was the general, the colonel, I can't remember, can you remember, Brian, was it a general or a colonel? Like a regiment, exactly. Like the, the elephants behave like an old British Army regiment, regiment uh, and that is probably from the fact that their collective noun, the original colonial collective noun, was a parade based off the military. When those elephants start marching in a in a row, they do look quite military-like, and when they get that water walk, it's like they're on the march. disappeared behind the clouds and we get this bank in front of us and we've got a bank behind us and only this little bit of blue which is directly above us at the moment waiting for Valentine's Day, just to throw a spanner in the works, but this is not over yet, and I know James and I are quite determined humans, but hopefully we will be able to pull a cat out of the hat. I'm very funny this morning, well I think that. James and I search in desperation for the Catterday's cats. And when I say desperation, James has got a fallen down tree to show you. Hello, everybody. You find me on top a acacia robusta branch bough that has blown off. I don't think this was broken by elephants, and I've climbed up here to try and find out why it came off. Um, I'm hoping that under the extreme mass of my body, it won't snap further and result in an injury. But what's happened here, I don't, it definitely wasn't an elephant. This has been blown off, and the inside of the trunk here has been infected by something. And quite interestingly, which you can't see from where you are, of course, well, you can see, you can see there's a swelling over here. Part of that would have just been the attachment of a large branch to the tree, but part of it, I think, is probably an infection. And if you look inside here, which I will do for you, the entire inside of the tree is rotten. So something has rotted this tree, I suspect some kind of a fungus. Now you can see the wood has totally disintegrated in the middle and eventually I believe that it gave out the strength required to hold up a bough of this size eventually just wasn't there. And so it would have snapped off in a strong wind and that's what's happened. I also hope to try and find some acacia gum here that we could have a taste of but I can't see any fresh stuff. There is some kind of crumbly stuff that I'm gonna bring down to you, and you and Andrew can have a taste of it shortly. It's this sort of crumbly, it's where the, it has definitely bled, this tree. And, oops, that was close. No, it's pretty tasteless. Normally acacia gum is actually quite nice to eat but this stuff is totally tasteless. I'll bring you some to have a look at. Just cut a little bit off with my knife, which is no longer very sharp. I need to get Steph to sharpen it for me. But I'll try and get you a little piece. It's, it's gone like, um, 
In fact, I can't even get it off. It's gone like uh, the top of a creme caramel. You know, that kind of fired sugar that gets blowtorched. That's what it's gone like under the influence of the air. Anyway, so that's Acacia robusta and a rather special tree, I think. Nice bough. And of course, when you, a tree like this does fall down, it's not the end of the world for the tree. The tree will probably survive this, but it's also a boon time for various other animals. And it'll be fascinating to know how long this wood will last here, because I suspect that within, say, two years' time, this wood would have disintegrated completely. It would have been eaten by the termites, eaten by the borer beetles, eaten by the fungus. And it's a whole new ecosystem created all on its own just from one breath of wind that blew slightly too hard and pushed off this tree. Marvellous. Whoops, again. Let me get off here before I do myself an injury. Okay. Wasn't that fascinating, Andrew? Not so much, okay? Well, that's okay then. Just move the quarry bush out of the way. Lots of elephant damage at the moment, of course, and especially when you're driving off road. But that's too big for an elephant to have pulled off. They could definitely push over a tree that size. But to have grabbed it with the trunk and pulled it off, I think, is highly unlikely. Right. On we go. Oh, let me plug myself in so that Geraldine might be able to transfer her sweet voice to my ears. Oh dear. Now, I must just admit to you that I'm seeing no tracks at all. We will keep looking for other interesting things. <laughs> Rich Levy, you're in Chicago, and you're obviously a historian, or certainly somebody who knows a bit about history. Now, north of us, everybody, is a reserve called the Manuleti, and the Manuleti is part of a network of reserves that aren't part of the Kruger National Park proper, but are unfenced to it. And the, so we've got the Sabi Sands here, the Manuleti, and then the Timbavati, or Associated Private Nature Reserves, to the north of that. And together, they make up about 200,000 hectares of land. And sandwiched in the middle there is the Manuleti. And Rich Levy, you want me to talk about the role of the Manuleti and where it, it's, its role during apartheid. Now, I don't know how much many of you know about the history of our troubled country, but it was a very troubled history to the extent that we had an extremely prejudiced government, of course, until 1994. And after that, well, that was the sort of birth of our democracy. And what it meant was that all public facilities and public spaces were segregated into spaces for black people and spaces for white people. And mostly everything was for the whites and the black people got the short end of the stick. But one thing that they did have was a small piece of land called the Manuleti, and that was supposed to be the black man's game reserve. So the whites had the whole of the Kruger National Park and blacks had a tiny piece called the Manuleti Game Reserve. And so that was the, that's the apartheid history, Rich Levy, of the Manuleti. That's not the case anymore. The Manuleti is now still owned by the, it's not owned by the National Parks Board, it's still run by the Provincial Parks Board, the Mpumalanga Parks, that's the province that it's in. And it's now got public camps. It's obviously open to everybody. All of the Kruger's open to everybody. But it's also got a couple of very beautiful commercial lodges uh, called, one of them is called Tinsualo, and the other is called Honey Guide. And they're very, very nice places to go and visit. I think the Manuleti is a, is a gem. It's a very beautiful and very underutilized reserve. The other thing that it's done though, of course, is create great conflict. And with the advent of democracy, people have been squabbling over land, quite rightfully so, you know, worried about 
reclaiming land that their ancestors had. And so there's a tremendous fight over who actually owns the Manileti at the moment. Various communities are at war with each other, saying, well, we own it, no, well, we own it. And of course, whenever there's a process like this, the actual voice of justice gets completely lost in the maelstrom of charlatans that immediately come out of the woodwork. So it is quite a conflicted space, the Manileti Game Reserve, but a very beautiful spot. So my plan from here is to carry on down towards twin dams now, where of course there isn't any water, but let's just go and see what there is there. We're driving past the area where Karula used to have her den. I don't believe she still has it here anymore, so I'm not even going to stick my head in there. While we're driving down here, Brent is at Sydney's dam where there is some water left. That's where we began our safari this morning. Let's see what's there with him and I'll catch up with you a little bit later. So the buffalo are just finishing their morning drink. We've got a wonderful little bit of zebra wandering off to the left. They're coming towards us, so we'll look at them a little bit later. And there's a little zebra foal. But this water hose becomes so important. To all the animals in the Manuleti and the Sabi Sands. So these buffalo herds look like they come in from the Manuleti throughout the day. I think it's multiple different herds. If buffalo have the choice, they will drink twice a day. In the dry season, sometimes only once a day because of the distance between food and water. No pandemonium of wild dogs this morning, or well, not yet at least. So this lapa is wondering if a crocodile might use that hole. Uh, it's a bit far to have a look at that uh, hole. It is possible, I think it's a little bit... It's definitely possible that the a crocodile might use that hole, but while there's water, it's going to use the water. Now, I think we definitely need to confirm whether there is actually a crocodile here or not. And crocodiles can go into a sort of sus suspended state uh, while there is a lack of water. And it, they would use caves and that on the edges of riverbeds and even rock caves up in the mountains, uh, as been recorded before. But while there is water like there is here, the crocodiles would stay in the water. So I think the best way to find whether there's a crocodile here is to come here at night with a spotlight and see if their eyes shine. It is very, very possible that there's a crocodile here. It could have moved from the Manuleti. It could have come from somewhere else in the Sabi Sands to take advantage of this water that's left in Sydney's. And there's some hippos that are still in there. You can see them between the dead trees or to the right of that right-hand dead tree. Now, just as we arrived, we saw a huge flock of birds coming in there. And we do see these birds occasionally, but not often in big flocks. So I'm going to see if we can closer to show them to you. These all seem to land in one particular tree. They're probably a bird that's really 
suffering quite a lot during this drought and are going to have to move ooh, quite vast distances for food. But before we get to those birds, I know a firm favourite of a lot of our viewers sitting up ahead of us and we haven't seen too many of them this wet season. But there we go, carmine bee eaters. up in the morning sun doing a bit of preening and you can see how more brightly colored the one is on the right the two on the left those are probably juveniles look at that incredible coloration of the carmine beta all oh, stretch wake up time Now, the other two on the left are still sort of hunched up in the sleep sort of mode or and puffed up, getting some morning heat. One on the right seems to be done preening and almost ready to head off in the hunt of insects. Just watch how the head's moving. It's become far more alert, looking for any possible flying insect about. amazing how birds groom themselves almost constantly and maintain, to try and maintain that sort of perfect aerodynamic shape, keeping the feathers in place, removing ones that are out of place. Oh, and as I said that, off, well, wait. Did it catch something? a bird of prey we actually don't see too often and I think that here we go look at him go very distinct shape to the tail and a very distinct beak nice Brian so it's not an eagle and you can see how its tail moves to help keep balance. So these are hunters and they're of the sort of lower areas. areas. They don't fly as high as the eagles. They hunt very much like this, scanning carefully over the ground. You can see how it's watching the ground, looking for insects or rodents even baby ground nesting birds occasionally. And this is also a migrant. And they migrate all the way from Mongolia and Russia. But it's not an eagle. So and for our birders out there, I wonder if any of you guys know what it is just yet. Definitely, I'm having a lot of fun with the bird quizzes this morning. I hope you guys are too. And who knows what bird that was. If you do, send your answers through to questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag SafariLive on Twitter. Well, let's try to sneak a little bit closer to these carmine bee eaters. Is that Brian? So we've got some answers in, we've got some correct answers in, but I'm gonna give a little bit more time uh, to some of the newer viewers, see if they can also have a guess. Here we go, look at the beautiful colors on that carmine. So I'm just trying to find that big flock of birds we saw earlier. I think I know which tree they went to. And as I said, they're going to be struggling quite
quite a lot at the moment due to this dry conditions. There's not going to be a lot of fruit around. And that big flock of birds we saw were fruit eaters. So let's leave the insectivore and try to find that big flock of fruit eaters that flew overhead. Now for me, the birds we're in search of now have one of the most incredible calls. And if any of you are Bond fans and have watched any of the really old James Bonds, where they have those massive sort of supercomputers and stuff, for me their call sounds almost exactly to what those old sort of 70s and 80s movies, what a computer should sound like. into this brown ivory. I don't want to go too close. I think they flew into there, Brian. Oh, we have a look in there. Uh, well done to R.C. Gerard Sacrosant and many others who got that predatory bird correct. It was a yellow-billed kite. So while we try to find these birds for you, let's jump across to James, who's got some highly mobile antelope. We've had this fantastic time with these impala, everyone. They've been running from about, I don't know, probably almost 500 meters from this position. They're clearly migrating towards some water the other side of the boundary and they're now about to cross the southern boundary and we've watched they're probably about 120 150 of them in the single herd and they've now been running in a line jumping over logs running through that dry dam and you can just see the remnants of them now they see them all hitting there's obviously some water down there on this reserve to the south of us and you can just see them there heading off into the bush. It was the most fantastic sighting. Isn't that beautiful? Now they are of course highly water dependent, which means they cannot do without water. They must be around water. And I think what you'll find now is that the forage is becoming more and more sparsely distributed, which means that they're going to have to move further and further away. What's the matter? Oh, Andrew has found him a slender ant on his hand that he wants to show you. <laughs> <laughs> but so there's the ant. That is a slender ant. Normally lives in an acacia thorn, actually. So as I was saying, what's happened it now is that the impala are going to have to move further and further away from water in order to get enough to eat because the vegetation near the water is going to be so sparsely distributed because of the amount that it's being eaten. There you are, Andrew. There is your slender ant. He doesn't want to be on TV, apparently. Like I say, they often live in acacia thorns. They drill into them. There's a beautiful shot. Look at him there. That is fantastic. Cleaning his little feelers. Look at his black eyes. Isn't that amazing? Oh, sorry, Andrew. I can't make him do... can't make him sit still. Let's quickly go across to Brent. He's got a giraffe drinking at Sydney's Dam. So while we were searching for those birds, I spotted some giraffe coming out of the woodland to come have a drink at Sydney's waterhole. So he was drinking. Hopefully he'll drink a bit again. Now for a giraffe, this is a time of great danger. While drinking, heads down, if there were lions about, this would be the time that the giraffe would feel most threatened. In 
incredible system of valves in a giraffe. Now you can imagine being that tall when you pop your head down for a drink, all that blood rushing down towards your head because they do have an incredible, incredibly large heart. So they have to shut off the blood flowing down towards their head to be able to drink. And they'll often drink, lift their head up, check for danger, and then drink again. There were a couple of others behind this one, but I can't see them just yet. There we go. Isn't that just beautiful to watch? male giraffe can stand about six meters in height which is about 20 foot and well weighs well over a ton so over 2,600 pounds so it's a massive animal biggest recorded giraffe was nearly two tons 4,000 pounds. <laughs> so, ox peck is getting a little bit annoying while that giraffe is drinking. I was hoping the other giraffe might come down to drink. There was a youngster with them, but we can't see them from where we are here. So we were chatting about when a giraffe pops its head down. So its circuitry system, its, 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 its blood flow system has some really unique adaptions. Its heart weighs in up to 11 kilograms, which is 25 pounds and is about two foot long. Now, isn't that absolutely massive? And it's gotta be that big uh, to be able to sort of maintain blood flow. It's got to have a, a very large pump. Ah, see what the giraffe spotted? Another giraffe coming in from the distance. Somewhere about there, I think. And further to the right. Okay. There it is. So that's not the original three I saw. That's another one coming in. just chatting about giraffe's hearts. Um, the walls of the hearts are three inches thick, about seven and a half centimeters. So I think we'll wait for this other giraffe to come down. It looks like they might meet up, but James has got one of the most rare birds in the Sabi Sands while we stand by with these giraffe. Now, that large turkey-like bird is called a ground hornbill, and it has a kill of some sort. I'm not sure what it was. It took it behind that bush as we came up here. 
And they're totally carnivorous, those hornbills. And I don't want to move because I think it'll run away. Let's maybe just sneak forward. Famous for eating tortoises. I don't think that was a tortoise. It didn't look like it had any shell attached to it. it may have been a tortoise. But it picked it up here. It killed something there. Ooh. That's exactly what it was, Andrew. It's a shell of a snail, right? Yes, a giant land snail. So it picked the giant land snail out of its shell and devoured it. Escar breakfast. Where's it gone? Oh, there it is. It's still hiding behind that bush. It's very clever in that way. There he comes. Now, the giant land snail, of course, is imminently eatable for human beings as well. I've never eaten one. But I know people who have. That is a beautiful, beautiful view of a ground hornbill. Not very closely related to the other hornbills. Isn't he lovely? This is quite stunning. I'm just going to try and ease back a little bit again. Don't go away, little bird. Don't go away. There's red wattles, or sort of red protuberances, on his face. Indicate what sex he is. Now, the females do have those, too, but they've also got a blue patch in the middle. And he didn't have that. So I think that's a male. And, of course, as Jerry's just pointing out to me, there is a lot of research done on these birds, and therefore he might have a ring on his foot. And I'll just check. I did look at his feet quite closely. I don't think there was a ring there. Lots of research goes on with these birds. Because they are so endangered. I don't see a ring there on the feet, no. What's interesting is what they do is they, they lay their eggs. They, they live in a flock, so to find one on his own like this is quite unusual. They live in a small flock of up to sort of five or six birds. They only breed for the first time when they are nine years old, so very long time before they reach sexual maturity. It's definitely a male, that one. And then they fly up into an enormous tree cavity. He's found something else to eat. Possibly a termite. They need an enormous tree cavity in which to nest. I mean, you can imagine, that bird is like an enormous turkey. He stands about two and a half feet high. So you can imagine the size of the tree cavity that he would need in order to nest. And then the female of the alpha pair in the flock will lay two eggs. Now, I'm going to just whisper quietly because he's coming quite close to us. And only one of them... Both, both chicks will hatch, but only one will survive. And so what the research projects do is when they know a flock is nesting, they go to the nest and they remove one of the eggs. They remove the egg that is laid second, and then they incubate them, and they will raise that chick on its own and then try and reintroduce it to a flock later on. And it's been quite effective. Let me just roll back here. I don't want to do it too fast. You see, every time we move, he turns away from us. Definitely better when we don't start the engine, though. Patricia, very good question while he's walking along the ground and hiding behind, <laughs> behind 
laughing behind a tree. You want to know if they fly or if they are strictly ground birds. Patricia, they fly very well, but they're very heavy, of course, and most of their hunting is done on foot on the ground, but they do fly. Very, f in fact, they're the only flightless bird that we get out here is an ostrich. If you are unable to fly out here, it normally means you will be eaten within seconds. So the only place you really find flightless birds, he's got something else there to eat. It looks like a grub. Hey, Andrew? Uh, it looks like a bit of a, uh, like a shell or something. Shell. It's too hard to see. No. Maybe a grub. I wonder if he's, prob he's probably also very good adept at finding where dung beetles have laid there, have buried there. He didn't like it. <laughs> where dung beetles have buried their balls, because in those balls, of course, will be very succulent little grubs to eat. So the only place I, just to, to finish that last little point off, the only place that you'll find ground-dwelling birds in great profusion are in island habitats where there are not natural mammals. And New Zealand is a very good example of that. Mauritius, of course, with the dodo was a good example of that. So on islands where there are no mammals to eat them, the birds often evolve in flightlessness. Out here, where there are lions and leopards and genets and civets and mongoose and that sort of thing, none of the birds will be able to survive without flight. Stunning. Natasha, I agree with you completely. An enormous privilege to be so close to this endangered hornbill. Brent is with five giraffe now, if you can believe it. So let's go and have a look at them. I'm going to head to Arethusa to just get an update from there. So all a journey of giraffe have appeared here at Sydney's waterhole. They are absolutely fascinating creatures with so many different specializations to be able to have that massive body and long neck. And then their skin on their, their legs is very thick and very tight to stop too much blood flow into their legs. And the arteries going to their head have seven valves in them to stop the blood flow when they lean down like that one is drinking there. Look at the little ones, they're playing. So we've got two little babies, two females, and an adult male. It's the biggest group of giraffe I've seen for a while. Now we're chatting about the skin on a giraffe's legs. And can you believe it? Scientists have studied that specifically uh, when developing fighter pilot suits and astronaut suits. So people in that line of work obviously deal with massive pressures as the giraffe has to do. Oh, look at that. Well, we'll finish that after these two little guys have finished their game. to finish off on the fighter pilots and astronauts and what they have to do with giraffes. So scientists studied that, specifically that thick skin and tight skin on the lower legs. So if you're an astronaut and a fighter pilot, if all your blood suddenly rushes to your legs, you're going to pass out and that can be quite detrimental, especially if you're flying an airplane at Mach 3. Uh, uh, so some of that, those developments would came from studying a giraffe's skin and their vascular system. It's a hippo on top of the damn wall as well. So Emily, who's 10 years old, 
in the very cold country of Canada, who's watching with her mum. Hello, mum. Hello, Emily. He's wondering, how long can a giraffe live for? Now, giraffe can actually live for quite a long time compared to a lot of the other animals out here. Uh, and you notice quite often, the bigger the animal, the longer the lifespan. So they can live for about 30 years in total, Emily. Oh, the little ones still seem to be wanting to game. Now, interesting about that hippo that's coming off the dam wall. It has been nice and cool this morning. So it's probably stayed out a little bit longer than it would have normally to try to get as much grazing time as possible. And now that the day is heating, it's heading back to the water. So Donna in Rhode Island is wondering, is it normal for giraffe to be in a group? She thought they were solitary. The males are sometimes solitary, moving between different groups, but it's, it's actually quite common for giraffes to live in little herds or little family groups. And I've seen groups of over 30 together. Now, that is generally in areas with high concentrations of acacias, so about 60 kilometers to the east of us here on the... Oh, look at that, look at that. Brocking and uh, bronking, almost. Bucking and bronking. Thinks it's in a radio. Is that two hippos? Or one? No, it's just one. So we've just, we've been watching these giraffe drink water and we've, we've spoken about some of their really special adaptations for being able to be that height and still lower their head low enough to drink. Matthew in Michigan is wondering, do they suck it up like elephants or do they lap it? Well, Matthew, they lap it. Oh, the little one's still on the, on the charge. So they lap it up with their tongue, Matthew. They don't suck like elephants. And Matthew's also wondering how long it takes, how long they can drink before they have to raise their head. Matthew, probably not, not, not much longer than a, a minute. Obviously, there's great pressure build up. And also, they like to keep their eye open on any potential predators, because this is when they're at their most vulnerable. There's an impala walking towards them as well. Here we go, she's going to drink now. You can see how any little bit of movement on the opposite bank, even those, there were some birds that flew past, caused her to raise her head. Yeah. Very, very alert when they are drinking. And it's great to see a nice little group of giraffe. There you go. See that impala running? Probably the sound caused her to lift her head there. So it pays to be cautious around the water hole. There's still one more drinking. She's been down for quite a while though. In between the male standing closest to us and the two moving away. And I think they're gonna move off now. I think we're gonna do the same. And before we go, you can see there's a hippo up there. There's still some, looks like the buffalo have settled very close to the water for the day. You can see them lying down. And they're gonna start ruminating. So they've obviously probably, they've probably traveled a vast distance to get here uh, to have a drink. So I think we're gonna sit down, have a lie down, chew the cud, 
and possibly take advantage of this water again a little bit later in the day. Wasn't that an awesome giraffe sizing? Definitely the best one we've had for a while. from these giraffes, I've got a, a last few couple of fun facts. And you can see how big they are. So, who would like to guess how long their intestines are? How long is a giraffe's intestines? Um, if anyone has an idea, pop me an email on questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. We couldn't find that big flock of birds when I was chatting about a little bit earlier. I did mention that they made the sound that sounded like an you know, sort of nice old 80s villain supercomputer while he was planning the destruction of the world. So I'll definitely play you their call and show you what bird it was. Technology beats me. Let's try again. Here we go. It sounds like a computer thinking, or if any of you can remember the original old modems, the dial up modems. So, so either a 1970s Bond villain computer thinking, or if any of you can remember the old dial up modems. Sounds very similar to that to me. Brian's nodding when I say dial-up modem. So, there we go, African green pigeon. species. So I know there are roller species in Asia and India, so it could quite easily be one of those. And find the rollouts. I've seen the majority of the roller species in, in Africa. There's very few that I'm missing. So, there's the first one. How's that, Brian? That is the broad billed roller. That's probably the only roller that we might possibly see here that we haven't. They prefer uh, river rind systems. So, I've seen them in the Sabi Sands around the Sand River. And then we, underneath it, we've got one we do see here. And that's the purple roller, also known as the Rufus Crowned Roller. And one of my favorites over here is one we don't get here, but I have seen them. Those are endemic to sort of the Central African rainforests. 
And that is a blue throated roller. And here we go, European roller, another one we commonly see here. The Abyssinian roller is one of the only rollers I haven't seen, and that occurs sort of uh, Ethiopia through the Sahel regions into West and North Africa. The Lilac breasted roller, a firm favorite. We've even seen one this morning. The Racket-tailed roller, which is quite a rare bird in South Africa, but quite common in Zambia and Southern Tanzania. It's a Miombo specialist. It likes a very particular type of woodland and then the only other roller I haven't seen and that is the Sahil, re it's also from the Sahil region up in West Africa and it is a blue bellied roller I think that should be all of them yep then we on to the bee eaters so out of all the roller species in Africa and there's only two I haven't seen I've never heard of a cinnamon roller but as I said there are rollers in Asia and India uh, maybe if you guys can check on Google for me uh, if there is a cinnamon roller and where it's from and obviously I'm going to have to add that on my to-do list to go find cinnamon rollers wherever they might be in the world. to come up into this area to check possibly any sign of shadow. We haven't seen any tracks yet. Lots of elephant and hippo moving through here during the night. And you can see that cloud cover is coming back in again. Apparently a cinnamon roller is another name for a broad build roller. I've never heard that in all my years of birding, so you learn something new every day. Thanks for that. They do occur in the Sabi Sands, but as I said, they are far more uh, attracted to river Rhine areas, so where there's permanent waters or big river beds. The Mawati, I'm afraid, is probably a little on the small side. So I have seen them in the Sabi Sands, but further south, uh, along the Sand River and along the Sabi River. I actually used to see them quite commonly on the Sand River. in a very sunny place, probably a very similar climate to what we experience out here, uh, Arizona. And I have been to Scottsdale and I think the climate there is very pleasant. And Christopher said he's curious about the names of the animals. Who would have named them apart from the local people? Well, the big naming and breaking up of animals when it comes to its scientific name and a lot of, a lot of animals Common names are derivatives or have come from the scientific name was Linus. Uh, Linus was the man who sorted out how we describe families, species, orders, all that. And uh, well, let's take a giraffe for example, uh, which we saw a few moments ago. Now a giraffe is actually an Arabic name, so it means the one who walks swiftly. There we go, There's a, that's where the origin of giraffe comes from. And you probably find 
the giraffes. Oh, whoa, Ellie's, yay. I'll finish this giraffe quickly and I'll pop into the elephants. Uh, that for many thousand years, um, the Arab nations have been trading with what is now the European nations. I mean, uh, Caesar was the first person to bring a giraffe to Europe, and that was in about 50 BC. And he bought it from Egypt. So the, you probably find the Arabic name stuck there. But the Romans and the Greeks, before even before the time of, time of Caesar, were great travelers. And uh, their giraffe was known to them. And they thought it was a really bad union between a leopard and a camel, hence part of the Latin name Camillo Pardus. I'm just going to move through where there's a nice gap. Hello, little monster. And here we go. Elephant, I'm actually not 100% sure where elephant comes from. The Latin, I do know, or oh, the scientific, I know where it comes from. And the scientific name for an elephant is Loxa Donta Africana. Loxa is long, Donta is teeth, and Africana is, of course, of Africa. So Loxa Donta Africana. I'll try to have a look here if I can see where the word elephant comes from. That's a lovely little breeding herd spread out and feeding through the bush. Oh, look at the little one. And you know, you're not quite big enough to push that over yet, my friend. And maybe you've got an itchy nose, or an itchy side to his nose. So Virginia in Kentucky is wondering what would elephants eat as a if they had an upset stomach and do they ever throw up? I've never actually seen the elephant throw up. I've seen them spit out sort of balls of vegetation that they weren't too happy with after chewing. Obviously it didn't taste too nice. But I've never actually seen them throw up. I'm sure it is possible. But for an upset stomach, I think they would probably just eat normally. Uh, try to get a bit more fiber. So I'm not actually sure where the word elephant comes from. I think if my somewhere in the recesses of my memory, I think it comes from ancient Greek or ancient Roman. I'm not 100% sure. See that little guy? Let me just roll forward for you, Brian. There's a nice gap. Go forward. There's a tiny little one. He's playing with his chunk, trying to get it to work. There we go. So we were talking about Linus and how things are classified now a lot of animals got their names so i'm sure most a lot of you will know it out there some of you might not so let's do the elephants since they're right in front of front of us they're in the kingdom animalia phylum chordata class mammalia order proboscisidae now, proboscisidae is obviously referring to their long nose, their proboscis. Family, elephantidae, genus, Loxodonta 
species Africana, Loxodonta Africana. So the long tooth of Africa. You go back a little bit. Back a little bit of so they're busy spreading out, feeding through this mixed woodland. They are definitely one of the most iconic species in Africa. And very different from the Indian elephant. Oh, where, where is he off to? Looking for mom. So much bigger ears, much bigger heads. On average, bigger tusks, just bigger in a lot of ways. And the skin is slightly different as well. You often notice that pink pigmentation on Asian elephants. Their trunks are different. An African elephant's got two prehensile tips at the end of the trunk, making them more dexterous with little things than the Asian elephant. It's only got one. And if you ever look at a picture of the two, they're very, very, very easy to tell apart. So Siberia Zumi is wondering whether African elephants were ever used for war, like the Indian elephants were. It's obviously quite a lot is lost in history, but there is rumors that uh, the Hannibal's elephants were actually African elephants that he marched across the Alps. I'm not so sure. I mean, that was, as I said, quite a long time ago. The only known use I know of African elephants was in the Congo rainforests uh, during the times of the King of Congo or the King of Luongo, uh, who controlled the whole western coast of Africa from what is now modern day Angola all the way up to the Camer so not Cameroon, no, it's, uh, the Equatorial Guinea uh, Gabon border. And they used forest elephants, tamed forest elephants, which are quite a bit smaller than the African elephant, uh, as logging machines to drag and move big logs in the forest that they used for building. Uh, I don't know of any case of them ever being used for war. And it was only that very specific uh, period of time under that very specific king when it was used. And that, that culture of using elephants for logging seem to fall away quite quickly. Now, even though the forest elephants and the bush or savanna elephants might look quite different, they are very closely related. Look, here comes a little one. And look at them go. So the scientific name for the forest elephants actually changed a couple of times and there's a huge amount of debate whether they should be their own species. But judging on the fact that they are able to mate with each other and crossbreed, they are probably just subspecies um, and they are probably very, they are very closely related. They've just got different physiological ad adaptations for the, the areas that they live in. So Cyclotis, uh, the forest elephant used to be Loxodonta cyclotis. That is now being changed to Loxodonta africana cyclotis. So you do find hybrids between the, two, the savanna and the forest elephants in certain parts where savanna and rainforest meet, and you've got a sort of mix mash between the two, so, which means me to believe they are far they are very closely related and they're able to produce viable offspring. Unlike, say, a lion and a tiger or a lion and a leopard, even if they were happen to mate and they're those terrible creatures in the world called ligers and all those things, where people have forced species not related uh, to breed and it is not a nice thing to do to an animal. There's more coming across the road. Uh, those offspring are 
barren and 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 unable to give birth to any 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 other cubs from there but where there's a forest elephant and a savannah elephant can breed and breed successfully the same goes for forest buffalo and 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 cape buffalo and there are hybrids of those as well where the savannas and forests meet and the scientific name for a forest buffalo is Cinerus cafra nanus because it's small it's a nano buffalo is edge down the road a little bit Thanks very much, Lady Luger. Oh, yes, hello, mister. Uh, who has sent through where elephant comes from. It is the Greek for ivory, but at the first time it appears in uh, Old English, and this is from Freedom Believer, thanks Freedom Believer, it is in the 13th century. Oh, itchy, yeah. So thanks to Lady Luger and freedom believer and you've helped me brush up on my elephant knowledge that is the wonderful thing about being on these live interactive safaris that you guys are able to help us uh, when we get a little bit stumped by us, certain things wondering about elephant feeding they have and we've touched on it a bit today and Claire would like to know do they they feed all day all their moments where they take a rest a snooze and, and don't feed they do and generally it's quite often in the heat of the day but for the majority of the time they will be feeding and moving and especially now that we're in a drought they'll probably feed longer and rest less right, due to the lack of food around oh look it's in the road ahead of us now we've been discussing the origins of animal names and there's the next one on the list down the road and this one i've got my own personal theory on oh yes sorry mister Brrr, to you too oh, cheeky little little boy got some wildly beasts or wildebeest that were moving up the road towards us. Now I have my own personal theory about where these chaps got their name from. So wildebeest basically translates to wild cow in Dutch and the first Dutch settlers to arrive in the Cape of Good Hope or it wasn't called the Cape of Good Hope back then it was called the Cape of Storms very risky area to take your ships through and they used to stop at what is now Cape Town to fill up with water and there would have been wildebeest there and I think it's possibly one of the first animals that was ever seen and the first Dutch sailors moving through that area would have noted that it looks sort of like a cow and would have called it a wild cow. There's the dominant bull who's spending his time with them. And I actually saw a very interesting article about a, a wildebeest ancestor that lived in Kenya about 60,000 years ago who had a very specific and very strangely shaped nasal crest which enabled them to snort and communicate over great distances. They still looked from their skull structure similar, but if we... Have a, is that what's that? My hat or my head? I'm trying to find my hand. 
oh, there's my hand. So they had a nasal crest that would come all the way almost up to the eyes and enable them to blast almost a trumpet, a, a, a trumpeting wildebeest. And that would have been definitely something I would have liked to see. So there are definitely various different types of wildebeest, but we can discuss those a little bit later. And let's go see what James has got on Arethusa. Right, hold on to your seats, everyone. Here we have a red-breasted swallow, two, a pair of them, and Andrew is managing to track them incredibly. Look at the way they fly. Just bear with us, it's not easy work here. And if you get seasick, maybe just step away from the screen slightly. Isn't that amazing? Look at the way that bird flies, it's like a little fighter jet. And the speed with which it's able to change direction is quite astonishing. What it's doing, it's hunting. It is catching insects on the wing, and it was flying very close to the ground before we came live and possibly picking insects off the ground. or well, not picking them off the ground, but picking them up as they take off. And they used to say, you know, when swallows were flying close to the ground, it was an indicator that rain would come. Well, that has clearly been misproven as an old wives' tale, because there is not going to be any rain here today. There were also some virtual starlings around, and a Senegal lapwing, and... What I want to do is just reverse slightly. I think there's probably some kind of insect emergence, perhaps some termites flying around, and that's why the swallows are out. You can see the swallow again. I'm not going to ask Andrew to try and film him again. Ooh, he's coming this side. And just behind us, we'll have a look at these Senegal lapwings. Oh, battalier, right above us. hear the birds calling it's because of that big raptor that came over he flew not oh, maybe 10 feet above our heads shallow wing beats typical of the battalier isn't that wonderful what a beautiful shot so actually Nice to compare the different flight patterns of the swallow and the batelier. Now, the swallow, of course, must have a long tail because it needs to change direction at an astonishing rate. The batelier needs a short tail because it is a soarer. It glides and it doesn't need to change direction very fast because it doesn't hunt things on the wing. It will either hunt things on the ground or actually predominantly scavenge. And so it doesn't need the same maneuverability that something like that swallow has. The swallow's tail is quite long. It's able to open up and close down. So it reduces drag, then increases drag so that it can pull the most incredible G-force as it turns. The batelier much more smooth. That's beautiful. So we know with the swallow, for example, that their, their ability to change direction is such that the g-force that is exerted on their brains is larger than the g-force that would be exerted on the brain of, say, an F-16 or F-22 Raptor pilot. So a modern-day fighter pilot could not come anywhere close to coping with the g-force that a swallow puts on its brain. So they have the most incredible system to deal with the incredible g-force that they do. They'll be flying along at 60 kilometers an hour. That's what, uh, probably 45 miles an hour, and they'll change direction immediately. And we watch them do it and we think, oh, well, that's quite amazing and it's nice to watch and it's quite interesting. Without possibly thinking about exactly what's going on there, the forces require the brain power, the number of 
different movements that the wings and tail and feet have to make in order for that swallow to make just one turn. And yet they're doing it again and again and again. And at the same time, looking out for insects to catch and then flying and sweeping them, catching them, swallowing them, changing direction, flying up, down, avoiding predators. It's an astonishing array of different processes that this bird has to engage in. And one that I think even the most modern computers would struggle to emulate. And I think it's just incredible. Right, we're on the Arethusa International Airstrip, which is appropriate for looking at flying things, I suppose. It doesn't seem to be a great deal. There are a couple of impala here. We did do a drive off to the far west of Arethusa and found nothing there, I'm afraid. Now, Anne, you're on Twitter, Anne T. Lope. First time you've heard from Antilope, isn't it, Andrew? Yes. Yes. The beautiful Twitter handle. Antilope, you want to know what the word batalier means. Batalier antilope apparently means tightrope walker or acrobat in old French. It's not a French word that I've ever heard a Frenchman use, or indeed when I used to guide if I ever had a French guest. I'd say, do you know what batelier means? And I've never met anybody who speaks, who is French, who would tell me, oh, well, it's called, it's an acrobat or a tumbler. But it seems to be from an old French word, meaning acrobat or tumbler. And for a long time, I actually didn't believe that that was the case until I came to Safari Live, and our audience, our wonderful viewers, did a lot of research into it and found out that it does come from an old French word called for acrobat or tumbler or juggler. And that, we think it's because of the way it flies. So if you look at it now, it's actually just in front of us again. And if you watch that bird fly, you see how it looks a bit like a tightrope walker. It doesn't have a tail, which means it's unstable in the air. And you can see it just kind of moving from side to side as it balances, a bit like a tightrope walker might. Not so much a juggler or acrobat. I suppose juggler, of course, was also interchangeable with the word clown at one stage. That's stunning. That's a female, Mrs. Batelier. Much easier to follow Mrs. Batelier with this camera than it is a swallow pulling the most tremendous G-force going from 60 kilometers an hour to zero and minus 60 within a few seconds. Beautiful. Well done, Andrew. So we know that that's a female. Sorry, I didn't actually tell you this, because the wings are almost entirely white underneath. The males are half black underneath and half white. And that one's just got a very thin strip of black underneath, and that makes it Mrs. Batelier. question from Eric in Virginia Beach, which I've always thought sounds like a wonderful place to go and see. Um, Eric, you want to know, you say that in the United States when birds migrate, they migrate through specific flyways. And do we have those sorts of things here? And is Juma perhaps in a flyway? And is the lack of, or is the drought affecting the number of birds that we have here at the moment? So lots of different questions. Yes, birds do have flyways here when they're migrating. We're kind of at the bottom end, though, of a migration. So we would never be part of a flyaway so much. I'm sure there are some birds that would fly periodically over us just from the south on their way north. But we're pretty much as south as m most of the birds will go. So they go north from here. So I wouldn't say we're ever sitting in an actual flyway as such. The birds are most certainly reduced, though. We, we know that from the dam. And that is really, it's, it's very sad. And 
if you go further north in Africa, if you go through into Spain or across the Isthmus of Suez, for example, there are very def definitive flyways there, and lots of birds unfortunately get caught and trapped and put in meals around those areas. Okay, let's head across to Brent. He's got some vervet monkeys to show you. We're heading back towards Juma. Look at this, we've got two vervet monkey mothers with very little babies. Uh, Brian just described one as looking like a stick insect as it scuttled away from mom. Oh, aren't they just the cutest things? Very, very interesting animals. Quite a lot of research has been done on them, especially in wild populations such as this. And it serves as a sort of non-human model for understanding quite a lot of human behavior. And they actually share some very interesting things that is very prevalent in humans, such as hypertension and anxiety. And also in certain cases, specifically around human habitation, they have one of the only animals that has become dependent on alcohol. So literally you can get alcoholic vervet monkeys. Who would have thought? So in areas where they've raided homes and, and things and, and, and have got a taste for alcohol, certain individuals have in, in the troop have become dependent on alcohol and aggressive uh, and showing very similar attributes to the sort of human alcoholics. So, and that is in a, in a natural, natural occurring troops that occur in, in the edges of cities and stuff like that, not out here. Let's try to sneak forward a bit. so amazing that they do show very similar things like anxiety and that which we, we always presume um, and oh look how close it is look at the little one hello little one where's he gone oh, let me just try to go forward a bit oh, he's is it too high for you Tickets. Look, they're hiding and watching us. Hello. Now, one of their defensive strategies against humans, because they spend a lot of time around human habitation, and they can become great pests. And they know we're not as good at spotting things and spotting movement as other animals. So what they're doing now is showing very distinct behavior. They move right off to the periphery of a tree. And then they'll quite often keep quite still and very quiet. And the people that are chasing them will forget that they're there. Uh, will not be able to find them. Oh, it's extending our tripod reach right to the very end. Now, this is a monkey species some of you in the United States might see. And even though it is very much an African species, it has been introduced to quite a lot of states uh, in the US. So if you've ever seen a vervet monkey in the US, I'd be fascinated to know. And there you go. Get him there, Brian. Too high. Looking down upon us, and the U.S. states that it's been introduced to is Florida, Texas, Alabama, Louisiana, Arizona, California, and then also some of the islands: uh, Cuba, Jamaica, Haiti, Dominican Republic as well, Bermuda, St. Kitts, Barbados. So very interesting. Now. In East Africa, I know of Sykes monkeys that have been introduced onto um, the islands off the coast, and they were introduced as food for the Portuguese soldiers that were based on those garrisons there. But very interesting stuff. So do let us know, even though it is close to the end of the show, uh, what 
If you've ever seen a vivid monkey in the U.S. of A, I'd be fascinated to know. But thanks for joining us on this Sunrise Safari. Catterday didn't quite work out, but uh, hopefully it will on this afternoon with James and Jamie. See you on the Sunset Safari.